Chapter Four: The Big Scheme. After we all made a few thousand bucks helping Niraj's dad run the hack on the gas stations, where he could fiddle people into paying more money for a less amount of gas, we decided that it was time to try the big leagues. We wanted to hatch a scheme where we would be able to make a substantial amount of money and retire for good. We did not want to do the small hacking projects over and over again, and increase our risk of getting caught. We wanted to pull off the heist of a lifetime. The plan was first put forward on a boring night. Our routine had gotten so good that it took us only a few minutes to get in and out of the school system, and it was all done without leaving a single trace. That had made us confident that we would succeed in whatever we tried, and the hack that we did for Niraj's dad had been the icing on the cake. It had been what we were looking forward to. We wanted to test our abilities and then push them further. Even though we were aware that the consequences of our actions would be severe if we were caught, it seemed impossible at the time that we would be caught. In light of all the preparation that we did and the training sessions that Pete held for us, we were sure that there was no agency on earth that would ever find us. The level of rules and regulations that Pete held us up to was immense. He wanted us to comply with a certain standard of hacking. Anything less than that was unacceptable. Luckily for him. The rest of us were of the same mindset. We were motivated not to get caught. We knew what we were doing, and how our lives would end the moment we got caught. However, in the face of all the rules that we had to follow for Pete, we never thought that we would get caught. Pete had learned all the rules from his dad, who had looked after both his sons, Pete and his older brother, after the mother had left them. Why she had left was anybody's guess. Although the prevalent opinion was that it was because Pete's dad was always engrossed in his work, he never had time for anything other than writing programming. He was so obsessed with his work that he taught both his boys everything he knew. He did not care what their age was; he just used to teach them daily. And one day they just started understanding him, and that was it. That is how Pete remembered his father and the start of his coding career. According to him, he started when he was seven years old. There were whiteboards that covered every wall in their house, and Pete would write code on the wall, just as he had seen his father and elder brother do. They used to spend time talking about code, writing, designing, and creating code, and that was the extent of their lives. That is how Pete knew so much about coding. He was taught by a genius. Not only was Pete taught by a genius, but he was also one. He was able to figure out solutions that were not even on the same dimensions as the box. His father realized that he had a prodigy on his hands, and proceeded to train him in such a way that only after a few years of training and coding, his father used to ask him for assistance with his work. Pete's dad was consulting for Google and Facebook at the time, and had even designed a part of the Windows operating system that maybe is still in use today. Pete used his knowledge of the structure of these operating systems to locate back doors into databases. And find information that he was looking for, since he was intimately familiar with their code structure, he was able to do so without leaving a single breadcrumb that would announce his presence. He was also an outstanding teacher. Within a few weeks, he was able to teach the coding basics that were likely second nature to him as easily and naturally as breathing was to us. After the rest of us showed sufficient aptitude, Pete decided that he wanted to move forward and make a team so that we could train properly. After much debate, the final members of the group were chosen. The reason for much debate was Tosh. She was a stellar coder, and Pete very much wanted her on the team. The only reservation we had was that she was Richard's girlfriend, and their relationship was rocky at best. It was not something that inspired confidence that the relationship would last for a long duration. Since Richard and Pete shared a small two-bedroom dorm. He did not want it to be awkward if Tosh was on the team and came over, and she and Richard would have to face each other, even if they had relationship issues. Pete did not want to compromise the team with personal relationships, even though we were friends. This was his thinking, and the rest of us agreed that a romantic relationship would not have a negative effect on the overall performance of the team. When Pete talked to Richard, his reaction was to make light sense of the whole thing. He did not give enough importance to the relationship to make it uncomfortable for him. If Tosh would continue to be a part of the team if they broke up, Pete was happy with his response since it meant that the team would continue to function properly. But I know that he was also troubled by Richard's 
casual attitude towards Tosh's feelings. I know that he tried to talk to Richard a couple of times about the way he treated Tosh, but Richard would either get upset that Pete was interfering in his relationship, or he would just laugh that this is what relationships were like in college. He would always tell Pete that he was taking himself too seriously and to loosen up a bit. Even though it was never apparent in any other way, we were always of the opinion that Richard was a little jealous of Pete's natural talent. He was a good programmer, but he had learned to hack from Pete. It was not something that came intuitively to him as it did to Pete. After the incident at the party, Pete had to look out for another enemy, for he was already trying to avoid Sebastian. Sebastian Farrow was a millionaire who wanted Pete to assist him to do a big job related to corporate espionage or insider trading. Well, that's what Pete thought and guessed. What else would a millionaire want to be associated with a college nerd? However, Pete was not into helping anyone with such motives. He wanted people to get ahead in their lives, but he also wanted to maintain some dignity. Nevertheless, that was the lowest of reasons, as Pete just did not like Sebastian very much. In fact, not at all. That was one of the main reasons why he was not interested in working for him. He did not even do the preliminary work or return his calls, and just outright refused him. Sosh was in agreement that Sebastian was not someone that we wanted to get ourselves tangled with. He was a nefarious person who would backstab us the first chance he got. That was written plain enough on Pete's face, but Sosh also collaborated that piece of information, which was just done on his part to emphasize how much we should avoid dealing with the guy. He was unreliable, and in our line of work, that was just someone that we could not work with. The people we worked with and for were the kind of people who understood the concept of mutually assured destruction. Just like Sebastian, Pete was also worried about the Chinese. He'd used the contacts he built while working with his father to help him get started when he had formed his new team. He wanted to make sure that he would not blunder into a situation where getting caught was an option. So he thought that having someone professional have his back was the way to go. His father worked on a secret project for the Israelis and had made contacts with a lot of shady people. Pete had worked on the project with him, and develop a knack for keeping good relations with the contacts they made at the time. The most prominent ones we knew of were the Russians, the Chinese, and the Israelis. We were always amazed at how swiftly they would answer Pete's call for assistance, and how much they trusted each other. The trust was not friendly, but it was the kind where each knew that no one would dare to let the boat sink, as they were all traveling in the same one. As I said, it was the concept of mutually assured destruction— Pete knew if he divulged any information about his contacts, he would have to pay for it as they would drag him down with them. This was something he made sure that his new team, that is us, understood. He knew the rules of the game before he even met us, while he was working with his dad. The thing with us was that we had a long learning curve to make up for, in a very short time. The test runs that we did helped us all a lot, and it made for an exciting time at college. We could not be bothered with the consequences of the whole thing. For us, it was like we were top flyers. We were the elite, and no one could touch us. We felt like how we imagined spies would feel when they were making clandestine decisions and their actions were shaping the future of the world. That is exactly what we were up to as well. The Chinese, and probably the Russians too, were hatching some sort of covert operation on American soil. They had done so many favors for Pete and our team that we could not refuse to help them even if we wanted to. The truth of the matter was that at the time, we were not picky about our method of operations, as long as we were talking about earning a lot of cash. Anything that promised a big payday, we were all for it. And the work with the Chinese promised exactly that. So we were all game. As I have mentioned before, after we carried out the job for Niraj's dad, we were all excited at the amount of money we had earned. It was after that we began to talk about making a plan for one big scam and then retiring for the rest of our lives. Our reason for this plan was that it was a greater risk when performing small scams. We would have to do them for a long time to make any decent amount of cash. And all the while, there would be the possibility that we would be caught. If we pulled one big scam, that chance would be greatly reduced and we would have enough money. Supposedly, that would allow us to stop hacking and go live normal lives, without the risk of looking over our shoulders that we might be caught at any moment. 
That is how we agreed with the Chinese idea of conducting a salami slicing scam. One boring night in college. We hypothesized that with Pete's dark web connections, it would be possible that we could get our hands on the banking information of thousands of accounts. The idea with the majority of assistance from the Chinese, refined by many hours of long debate, was to get our hand on as many accounts as we could. We would then start a siphoning system that makes sure that each month all accounts pay a certain amount to a bill that was added to their monthly payments, and the amount that they pay off would be delivered into the accounts that we had specified. It was a scheme that seemed brilliant in its simplicity. Everything was automated, so no one went out to pay their bills anymore. Everything was scheduled on their electronic devices, and the payments happened in this way as well. All they got was a notification that a particular amount had been paid as a result of a certain bill becoming due. For example, the monthly bills had the same name as the electricity, water, mobile, and groceries were all done automatically, and no one looked closely at the exact amount. We siphoned information from so many accounts that all we had to do was set up these accounts to pay a few extra cents each month, and soon we had amassed a fortune in all the accounts that we had set up. Once again, Li Juan and Pete's genius had saved us a lot of hard work. He was able to write a sophisticated code that would assign the extra amount to an already existing purchase or to an item that the buyer would actually buy and be something that would not stand out. The next phase was also something that Pete's program was able to help with, the delivering of the money into the different accounts that we had set up only for this purpose. The program would deliver the amount and we would be notified each time a delivery was made. Now we had run into a little problem as we began in the most important part of the operation, the acquiring of the information of as many accounts as possible. Pete had contacted the Chinese, and they had made sure that within a few hours, we had the account information of nearly 130,000 accounts. Even in this case, when Pete offered to pay them, they refused by saying they would collect payment in their own way, and Pete would have to be ready when they wanted his expertise. They now specified that they wanted his whole team, and not just him. Well, they had seen the way we operated as a team, and were impressed with how smoothly we interacted with each other, and how we were able to smoothly transition from one phase to the next. They said that it was important for their mission that we practice all our skills, and have them honed to the point of perfection before they called for them. At the time, we were all excited because a lot was happening in our lives. We were doing several things, and everything felt like it was creating a way for even better things to enter our lives. We were making money like it was an easy business. These things were making us full of ourselves and were stopping us from giving any thought to the consequences of our actions. Anyway, we were partying and had become even more popular in college and over the dark web. People were looking for us to work with them and were willing to pay as much as we wanted. It was due to the caution of Pete and the expertise of Sosh that we were able to stay out of prison. For if not for them, we would have ended up doing business with every Tom, Dick, and Harry that showed up at our door especially if it were up to Richard. He was the one who kept pushing Pete to get the Chinese to give us the information of even more accounts. Even though Pete was continually telling him that the greater number of accounts that his program was working with, the higher the risk that it would be discovered, and the higher the risk that we would be caught as a result. It so happened that our work had not gone unnoticed by FBI Cybercrime Division, and they were on the trail of these seemingly unrelated scams that were suddenly on the rise. We were walking towards a trap, and at the time, we were not even aware of it. It was something that would change the course of our entire lives, as well as the dynamic of this team that Pete had so painstakingly built and trained. Please pick up the second book, Rise of the CEOs, and We Are Back, from the Dark Cumulus series at your nearest bookstore or on Amazon.com.